Merry Christmas and a uh, Happy New Year. Well, in a couple of days time, but Happy New Year, Happy 2020. Uh, it's been a good year. 2019 has been good to me, actually. I got married, we're expecting a baby, been traveling, been working, been out in a camper van. It's been a great year. So I hope 2019 has been as wonderful to you as it has to me. And yeah, I hope you've had a good year. New Year's intentions. What we're gonna do moving forward. I I thought it'd be a good idea to make a video on how to make money with your camera. This might be something that you're thinking of doing next year, something that you want to try, something that is an interest of yours. If you're watching this channel, chances are that you own a camera, that you're interested in photography, videography. I have a playlist on all sorts of how-to videos that might help expand your knowledge. So have a look at that playlist and please subscribe if you want to keep up to date with more that's going to be coming along as well. So how to make money using your camera. You probably already have a camera. You probably already have bits and pieces. I've, I've been taking pictures for 20 years and so I've got cameras, lenses, flashes, microphones, lights, all sorts of stuff. I've just built them up over time. It might be that you've decided you want to do this so you've gone out and bought all the kit that you need. But how can you then start to use that to start to make some money? Now. I'm not talking about if you went to film school, if you went to photographic school, if you are a journalist, any of that sort of stuff, you probably already know how to make money with your camera. You have contacts, you have all sorts of ways and means to be able to start making money with what you've got. This applies more to people like myself who maybe don't have those links, don't have those contacts. It's a sideline, not a main job. I'm a dentist by day. And one of the things that I love about my job as a dentist is when there's not a patient in the chair, my time is my own. So I have a lot of free time, evenings and weekends. I suspect that with a child coming, that might be reduced slightly, uh, but I have lots of time to be able to do these jobs and to be able to earn some money with my camera. And I love it. I, I do the jobs that I want to do. I do jobs that I'm interested in. I do work that interests me and that's the first thing that I'd say for you is actually do the work that you're interested in because and there's an old adage if you do what you love you'll never work a day in your life you will not be put off doing your photography and videography if you're working with people that share similar interests if you're doing jobs that fit in with what you want to do you'll enjoy it far more you'll probably do a better job and you'll get more work so the two things that I think are probably the most difficult part of starting to make money with photography and videography is where to find jobs and how much to charge for them. Where to find jobs. I'm interested in yoga, I'm interested in fitness, I'm interested in well-being, and in this area, everybody is either a yoga teacher or training to be a yoga teacher, or they're training to be a personal trainer, or they're being a life coach. All of these people need content for their Instagram, for their YouTube, for their Facebook, for their webpage, and you can help them create that content. If you're not into those things, look around you. There may be people that are interested in wood turning or blacksmithing or motorbikes or cars or whatever it is that you're interested in who will also need content. And that's a really good place to start. You will have friends, you will have family, you will have contacts that will want content and talk to them because that's that's a really good place to start. This idea of contacting the big companies, if, if you're into cars and suddenly you're just phoning up Mercedes and saying, can I come and work for you? It might work. It's not necessarily guaranteed to. And if you get told no a few times, it might put you off and you might decide you don't want to carry on doing it. But if you build up your portfolio of work to the point where somebody at Mercedes notices you, great chance are you'll get to work with Mercedes. It's it's building up those contacts and doing smaller jobs that may lead to bigger jobs in the future. Speaking of smaller jobs, payment, how much do I charge? That was a real mind game for me of working out how much to charge people. I, I talked to various people, a friend of mine paid £3,000 for a video for her website and I thought, wow, that's that sounds great. But actually, 
when you look into it, she didn't enjoy the experience, she didn't enjoy the shoot, the video that came out of it, she didn't ever use, she didn't use the photographs that she got from it because it wasn't what she wanted. Talking to the people, they didn't, they weren't interested in listening to what she wanted to produce. So they produced the video that they wanted to produce, which was not a video she wanted to use. So actually, although they might have made £3,000 out of her, they've lost out on so many potential jobs because they're not being recommended by her. They're not having their work seen. So I think sometimes it's best to actually start small and think logically about how long you're actually going to be shooting for, what you're going to be doing, uh, and working with the client to be able to make sure that you're going to produce what they want. To begin with, this is going to be a little bit of a sideline and hopefully will turn into something bigger. So I use two approaches. The first one is just very simply, I work out how long I'm actually going to spend on the videos. So I talk to the client, if they say they want a one minute video for Instagram, depending on what it is that we're shooting, it's probably going to take about an hour to shoot and a couple of hours to edit. So I'll say, okay, that's three hours and my hourly rate is X amount. In terms of setting your own hourly amount, work out what you'd be willing to spend if somebody spent an hour with you. So for yoga, I know how much an hour's yoga teacher, one one on one yoga session costs if you want to go and hire a space, if you, any of these sorts of things. Work out how much you would want to make per hour, what you feel is reasonable, and then just multiply that by how many hours you're gonna be spending on it. Quick note on this, editing. When I first started, I grossly underestimated how long editing actually took me. I just, because when I was shooting for my own stuff, it probably took me as long to shoot it as it did to edit it. When you're shooting for other people, you're probably gonna spend twice as long on editing as you are on shooting, so just factor that in. The other option, and I think this is something that I stole from James Popsis. If you don't know James Popsis, much more successful YouTuber than I am, but really nice guy and professional photographer, although I think he now says he's a professional YouTuber. He talks about this idea of reverse bidding. If a big company, say YouTube, Google, Mercedes, wants a photo job done, they will put out uh, a call to say, we're, this is what we want achieved, how much will you charge and photographers or bid for that job? If I'm working with somebody, so I've had a few clients come to me and this often happens more with the bigger corporate clients, they'll come to me and say, we want you to do a job for us, uh, how much are you gonna charge? And I'll say, what do you want to spend? Give me the lowest amount you, you think you can spend, give me the maximum that you possibly could spend and give me the amount that you ideally would like to spend. And I come up with three plans for what I can do for that amount of money. So you look at the bottom one, you say, okay, I can spend three hours shooting, I can produce 40 pictures, three two minute videos, and we'll do some basic editing. For the maximum amount, I'm gonna bring all my gear, I'm gonna do fancy editing for the final thing, I'll be able to produce your videos for Instagram and for Facebook and for YouTube and for this, and I, I will produce a range of formats and times to be able to, maybe I'll do a 15 second edit that you can put in stories. And you can just add more value depending on how much people want to, to spend and you can tailor it that way. You also get a sense of what they want and you can judge their expectations because managing your expectations and managing their expectations, that's the balancing act, making sure that you're both happy with the outcome because if you are, you'll continue to get work. If you're not, they won't want you to work for them again and they're unlikely to recommend you to other people. So I would say that's a good approach and don't, yeah, don't immediately go for the high amount because it's, Short term, you might not earn as much immediately, but you'll get more work, more clients. I've now got a nice bank of clients that I work with on a regular basis who supply me with most of my work. So one of the other big things that I see, there's a real division on guidance on this, on working for free. Working free is a really interesting area in as much as should you work for free? Should you offer your skills for free? Are you undervaluing yourself? I, I think it's fair to say, I have worked for free, but never having been asked to work for free, if that makes sense. So if somebody approaches you and says, I want you to do a job for me, I haven't got any budget, but I'd like you to do it and we'll give you really good exposure. 
What does that exposure mean? Are they actually going to recommend you to other people? Does it mean that potentially they might use you in the future? I have been in the situation where somebody said, look, we don't have a budget for this event, but actually we've got four more events that actually if you agree to do this, we will agree to do you for the other four and you'll get paid for those other four. Now, I don't see that as working for free. If you can guarantee that you've got a positive outcome, if you're working for trade, then great. So if my best friend Charlotte that I've done a lot of filming for, you will have seen her on this channel. I don't charge her to do her filming, but what happens is I know that she's my greatest advocate. She tells everybody to use me and I have got so much work from her recommending me to other people that it has paid for itself by doing the work for her. Plus she's my best friend and we get to hang out and just mess around and it, it's good fun. So it doesn't feel like working when I'm working with her and it has led to other things. So if you can guarantee that you're gonna get further leads out of it, but just this exposure, that what does that mean? What is the tangible benefit? The other way that I've worked free is doing sort of preemptive, proactive stuff. So the blacksmith is probably the best example I can give you. I went on a blacksmithing course at the beginning of this year that my mum got me a voucher for Christmas. It was fantastic. Took my camera along, did some filming while I was there. Really enjoyed it, really enjoyed filming it and was just gonna put it up on my YouTube channel. Emailed the guy and he said, that's great. We'd love you to do more videos. Can we use this video? Can we use this in our advertising? I'd already made it. I made it for my own pleasure. So yeah, feel free and actually I'm now working with him where I get to go and make stuff in the blacksmithing, in the forge, and he gets to use my videos. So it's, I'm not getting an extra line on my bank statement, but actually I'm getting a real tangible benefit from it. And that is a really good way of being able to supplement your lifestyle, do some extra bits and pieces, enjoy extra things. I've been able to go on go-karting days and uh, I've got gym membership and various things from doing these things. And that that's not, like I say, a line on the bank statement, but it's money that I don't need to spend to be able to do these things. So there is that tangible benefit from it. So I would say don't work for free if somebody asks you to work for them, but sometimes it can be offered and in trade is a really good option. So I work on my own. When I'm working with clients, it's just me there. And there are some really major benefits and there are some really major negatives. Biggest negatives are, doesn't always look super professional if you're turning up to a big corporation, but actually so long as you can show that you can do the job, they're not gonna worry. It's you just need to show that you can do what you're doing. If you've got kit, it helps. It does mean you need to carry the kit, which can be a bit exhausting if you're carrying everything yourself. Um, but actually in terms of negatives of working on your own, the sort of projects that I'm talking about working on your own is fine. If you were doing a big corporate shoot where you had to wrangle 20 or 30 people and you had to do all of this sort of stuff, working on your own might be a little bit more challenging. But for simple shoots, working on your own is great. You don't have to split the cost with anyone. You know exactly what you're doing. So you can set the camera up, set the lights up, set the mics up to be able to get the best possible footage to then edit with. You're in control of what's actually being shot to then edit and you can then edit it to be able to get exactly what you want. So you're in control of the whole workflow. And also with smaller shoots, it's just less intimidating actually. If uh, So Fru, I was working with Fru uh, a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, just before Christmas, and it was just me and her, and she was so much more relaxed. First few times I worked with her, she was very camera shy, was not a brilliant, we didn't get a huge amount of results out of it, but she has relaxed and calmed down. I know if I turned up with me and a sound guy and a light guy, suddenly we'd be back to that. But now that she's working with me, she feels so much more comfortable. And so when you're working with just a couple of people, being on your own is a lot less intimidating. The camera, you should not underestimate how intimidating the camera is, somebody that doesn't like being on camera. If you've then got four other people around you, it's a really intimidating situation and camera shyness is 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 definitely a thing. You you will you will experience it. Yeah, let me just cut across to working with Fru, because actually I said some interesting bits. I think I said some interesting bits in that and, and she came up with a few interesting points. So just gonna cut across to the shoot that I did with Fruit and just give you a bit of a feeling of, of how we were working there. I've decided that stealing shots is the easiest way for me to set up for vlogs if I'm like working it. for other people. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, because you can just jump in. And I was talking to the camera, but. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> 
So we are filming. Yes, there's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly saw you walking into it. Um, we're filming with Fru Francesca Elizabeth Williams, who is setting up new courses. These are new courses. It's sort it's of a one long... I've run already before, but it'd be the second round of running it. Okay, so we're helping to film some introductions, some adverts, some various bits and pieces. We're in a fantastic space, Brighter Spaces in Guildford, which is a treatment room, therapy room, conference room type setup where, yeah, just lovely rooms to be able to hire for incredibly reasonable rates. Actually, I was quite surprised. I didn't hire this. Fru sorted all of this out. And I'm definitely going to be coming back here to, to hire the rooms again in the future. Um, so, yeah, we're just doing some recording. So this is more of what I do. Fru is utterly relaxed now because we have finally... I'm filming this after we've finished doing all her recordings. So we've been here for about two hours. And we've done brilliantly. I have filmed with Fru in the past. And we did... Was it like four hours filming? Mm. And we got precisely nothing usable out of it. Pretty much, yeah. And I think that was where I have learned more about how to help you as well. Yeah. Because I assumed that you, I made the assumption that you had more of it set up and organized. Yeah. And so I wasn't following along. So one of the big things that I was doing today was while we were filming, I was following along with my copy of the script. So I was taking more of not just the cameraman role, but the director role as well. So I could actually make sure that she was doing exactly what she wanted to be doing. We could make sure that all the takes were good, all of that sort of stuff. We did some practice read throughs where she was just reading off the script and then just taking it through. Because last time, essentially what I ended up having to try and do was cut together. And that was exhausting. That was one of the most exhausting editing processes that I've ever had. And we didn't even get anything that used because it just ended up cutting. We were in a beautiful woods in Bluebell Woods. So the video is, is on the channel. Go and have a look at that. But it's, yeah, it just, it, it, planning your shoots. This is something that I've learned so much more that actually planning exactly what you're going to be doing makes life so, so much easier. So we've now finished. She is absolutely overjoyed that we have finally finished recording everything that we were going to do. And now we're going to take a couple of pictures and we're going to do some little bits of b-roll and stuff like that so we've got some options should we want it and then yeah that's it now we're gonna go get starbucks yes because it's nearly christmas it's two days before christmas uh, and we're both recovering from colds and it's just and flu yes so yeah, it's thanks just, your help you're so welcome it's been an absolute pleasure you've been amazing you've been amazing, you've been amazing. so good at directing so i try my best i i think i've got better yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I um, I think, yeah, as you say, having that um, clear process and knowing what roles we both have in that as well, I think really helps. Yeah, um, yeah that and was, I think that it would have been good. more seamless had we both not been ill before. Um, yes. Obviously, was planning on not... Dying in a hole. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I was hoping to have all the um, film scripting and everything done before. But actually, <laughs> it was time. still pretty seamless. It was, it didn't feel... Mm. We knew you knew what you wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I think that also comes from having, like, since we last filmed, really knowing who I'm working with and what I'm doing as well. Whereas before, like that whole thing you were saying about I'm a life coach, like, what does that mean? Who are you coaching? You basketball playing or like, do you know what I mean? I think having that real strong identification of what I'm doing is actually, you know, my job. <laughs> 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 I know what I do now. <laughs> so. I think that's a really good point. It's about understanding what you're doing. It's understanding who you're selling to, it's understanding who your clients are, it's understanding what they want. And that does take time and it does take practice to be able to understand what you can produce and what you can produce for the clients and how it's all gonna work well and together and all of those sorts of things. It's It takes a while to get that knowledge. And there are two things that I'd say that you need to think carefully about in terms of the limitations that you need to put on, on what you're actually going to do. And that's your skill set and that's your equipment. Let's cover equipment quickly first. So at the moment, I'm not going to show you the setup that I've got in here because I'm in my study and it's also my walk-in wardrobe and it's, it's everything. I'm assuming everybody has a chair like this somewhere in their house that basically is the chair where anything that's not quite clean enough to be put away but also anything that's not dirty enough to need to be washed just gets dumped. That's going on underneath the camera at the moment and you, you don't need to see that. 
got a light, got a microphone. If you don't have a set of lights, if you don't have a microphone, first of all, if you don't have a microphone, you're gonna be limited in terms of what videography work you can do. But in terms of making money with your camera, your only limit is what you can actually provide yourself. So if you've got a camera and a lens, I did a shoot, I've done so many shoots that are just photography based where I've taken a camera and a lens and done my shoot with that. I did one recently down at West Wittering uh, at sunset and it was a beautiful evening. It light was fantastic. I didn't need any light modifiers. I didn't need any reflectors, lights, anything like that. And I actually did almost all of it on just one lens. So if you've got a camera and a lens, that's a job you can do, that was great. Equally, when it came to the corporate work, because we needed to film it in their office and the lighting in the office wasn't brilliant, we needed to take, I say we, I needed to take several different lights, I took my microphone, I took a couple of cameras so I could get a couple of different angles, and yeah, it, it worked brilliantly. I really enjoyed doing that, and if I hadn't had the kit with me, we couldn't have achieved quite such a professional look. Knowing what you need and knowing what you can achieve, that's a real key element to not underselling yourself. If you think, yeah, I can do this, but I, if I, it would be better if I had that bit of kit and you do it and it doesn't look professional, they're not likely to use you again. Having said that, the kit doesn't need to be expensive. The light panels that I've got in here are not big fancy sort of multi hundred pound aperture lights with soft boxes and this that, and the other. They are, they were from the photography show last year. They were cheap and cheerful LED panels that I can adjust the intensity and I can adjust the uh, warmth. They're not the brightest things in the world. They're not gonna be able to light massive spaces, but for shots like this, perfect. Works brilliantly. The, I never know how to pronounce it, N-E-E-W-E-R, Neuer, Neuer, Nia, um, that you get off Amazon. They produce light stands, microphones, LED lights, all sorts of things. I've got so much kit from them that I've bought over the years because I thought, okay, I need that bit of kit for this job. And I have no idea whether I want to invest in a full blown fancy piece of kit. And some of it has been great and some of it has been resigned to the bin. Actually, I've never thrown it away. I just, it gets stored in various places. I bought a cheap slider from them that never got used a lot. And I got a shoulder rig from them that I've never really used a lot. The shoulder rig, it just doesn't go with my style of filming very much. So it's not something that I need to use a lot. However, it's there if I do ever need to use it. So being able to buy cheaper equipment that you can try out, at least it means then you can maybe expand what you can do in terms of your jobs. And if you discover you're using it a lot, maybe reinvest some of the money into buying better equipment. It's a really good option. And then understanding your skill set, understanding what you can do. If you're a landscape photographer and someone asks you for portraits, do you know that you can take good portraits? I think for me, as a photographer, I've never wanted to pigeonhole myself into one type of photography. So I do portraits, I do landscapes, I do night photography, I do lifestyle, I do reportage, I do corporate headshots. I've tried, I've at sports, yeah, done, I've done it all. And I've got that experience. So there aren't many jobs that somebody could present to me that I wouldn't have some experience of doing to be able to rely on that experience to be able to do well. However, if you are, if you really think of yourself as a landscape photographer and someone asks you to come do corporate headshots, are you going to be able to do that and do that well? If you've only ever filmed birthday parties and suddenly someone wants the, an action shot from your local go-kart track, will you be able to apply that knowledge? Will you be able to transfer it? Sometimes it's worth thinking actually, if your skill set is lacking, how can you develop it? For 2020, what can you do to be able to give yourself more opportunity to make more money from your camera? Do you need to do some courses? Do you need to go online and look at my playlist of how to and see if there's anything on there that's useful? Do you need to just get more experience? Do you need to take more portraits? Ask your friends, ask your family. I'm sure they will let you take portraits of them. Or try it yourself. I've got a video on how to do better selfies because actually learning how to light and shoot portraits can work really well with using yourself as a subject. So do you need to learn new skills for 2020 to be able to make sure that you can provide more value, which gets you more jobs? Do you need to learn more about editing? Do you need to learn more about color grading? These sorts of things. It's, this is our learning objective for 2020. It's how you can develop yourself 
to be able to make more money. And sometimes that means investing some of the money that you've earned into learning new skills. So I think that's a really good option for how you can actually make more money with what you're doing. Right, I think that's about it. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you'd like to. Like I say, there's how-to videos, there's camper fan videos, there's camera stuff, there's just lifestyle stuff. So please, if you'd like to subscribe, please do. If you'd like to like the video, please do. And thank you very much for watching. Um, if there's anything I missed, any hints that you've got, tips that you've got, please put them in the comments. That would be a really nice thing to help sort of develop a bit of camaraderie amongst these people. I want to hear your stories. How did you get your start in making money with photography? Please put it in the comments below. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.